Hi everyone, Figmac here. Welcome to another QualQuest video. So today we're asked to evaluate this weird integral here. We have x over the sinh of pi x dx uh, from negative infinity to infinity. Uh, the sinh function can be written as this way. We have uh, for a certain value pi x in our case, we would have e to the pi x minus e to the minus pi x over 2. So uh, in order to solve this, we're going to have to go back to our friend contour integration. Alright, so following our uh, typical contour integration techniques, uh, we have to find our poles, find the residues of our poles, and then work from there. So in the case of cinch pi z going into the complex plane, we need to find where pi or cinch of pi z is equal to zero. Again, we can split it into our Cartesian coordinates, x plus yi. Uh, when you do a sum of two things inside of a cinch, it's very much like you would if you were doing a, you know, a sum of two things. So you have sense of one plus the cos of the other plus the cos of the first times the sense of the second. Um, here we have cos of y pi i, uh, which is actually the same as the cosine of y pi. And the sinh of y pi i is i times the, sin, the sine of y pi. Um, might be plus or minus, I forget. But anyway, we want that, we want both the real and the imaginary parts equal zero. Um, one thing we know is that the Cauch function never is zero. Its minimum value is one. So we need to then set our sine of y pi to zero, which then means that y can be any number, any uh, natural number or any integer, really. So that's going to be a problem. But then the other case is we need a real part to be zero. So cosine of some integer pi is going to be plus or minus 1, so that can't be 0. So then our cinch has to be 0, and fortunately for us, it's only at one point x equals 0. Uh, looking over here at our complex graph, we are going to have the entire imaginary axis lined up with these poles at each uh, integer point. So how are we going to do a contour path? I mean, normally we want to do like a nice semi-circular path, but that would include taking every residue up to infinity. So we're going to have to try something a little different. So here is a rough sketch of the path that we are going to take. Uh, basically, we're going to do this weird box function. Sorry, I'm trying to keep it as level as possible. Uh, basically, we're going to start here at the point negative r0, uh, go counterclockwise. We're going to actually go around the residue at 0. Uh, continue on the real axis, uh, go up to point R, then go up the imaginary axis to until uh, our imaginary component is 1. So up here our general equation would be z equals x plus i. Then we're going to go left, uh, go around this other residue again, then left more, and back down to our original spot. Um, in doing this, we're then going to have to take a limit as r goes to infinity, that way we get our negative infinity to infinity integral. And then we want to take uh, our circular paths of a radius epsilon down here, and then we're going to also need to take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. The good thing is with this path we were able to avoid all of the poles. So we already know that our total integral is going to be zero. We'll see what happens as we take these little humps right here. Something might happen. Okay, so let's deal with our n segments first, uh, which were C4 and C8, if I remember correctly, where basically we were going up or down along the imaginary axis, or in the, in the direction of the imaginary axis. So we had some real plus or minus r plus yi, and then we're going to be integrating along our path y. So for C4, we plug in our r plus i y for z. Um, our dz would become i dy. And we would be integrating from 0 to 1 as we're going up. And then for C8, it would be minus r. And then we would be integrating from 1 to 0 since we're going downward. Um, so fortunately for us in this case, um, I'm oversimplifying things a little bit just for time's sake. But as r goes to infinity, so the singe of r plus iy, since y is just between 0 and 1 somewhere, um, it's going to become dominated by just a cinch of plus or minus r. And for the, both cases, um, our 
cinch is then going to be roughly on the order of e to the r, or absolute value of r. So essentially, as r goes to infinity, we're going to be integrating something of r over e to the absolute value of r. So obviously these are both very big, these would both go to infinity, but e to the r would go to infinity much, much faster. So then our integral on both sides is basically going to become zero on the inside. So then we know that for our two uh, vertical paths, uh, we don't have to worry about them. Okay, so now for our bottom circular path, which was C2 in our case, um, remember we're going to be going around a tiny circle, uh, around, this, around the origin with a uh, radius epsilon. So we set z equal epsilon e to the i theta. Uh, we then find our dz by just, you know, integrating this thing, or, or taking the derivative of this thing. Uh, for c3, the integral, we want to find the limit as epsilon goes to zero so that we concentrate that pole to see what happens around here. So we plug in our e to the i theta for our z and our dz. Uh, we're going to have e squared uh, over cinch of ep or epsilon squared, sorry, over cinch of epsilon e to the i theta. So basically, um, again, cutting a couple corners, if as we take epsilon to zero, uh, we will have zero over zero, but epsilon squared will go to zero faster. So again, this, the thing inside this integral will decay to zero more quickly, and thus the whole integral for C3 is just zero. Does the same thing happen at C6? Okay, I realize I've been uh, dropping the pi from our cinch a couple of times, but I think everything is still uh, good and under control. So for our integral C6, uh, remember we're, we have a circular path, but we're at a point i above the origin. So that's why we have this plus i here. Uh, our dz is the same as before. Uh, and then since we have two parts, I just broke our integral into two parts here. One for the e, I, e, epsilon e to the i theta and one for the i. Um, if you'll notice, we have, again up here we have epsilon squared e to the 2i theta over cinch of things. So like before, this half is going to go away, which is good. Uh, again, remember the other thing is since our path went under the under the pole, our, in, our direction is from 0 to minus pi. Um, cleaning up terms a little bit more, you know, plugging in i plus e epsilon e to the i theta for our z, um, we will get left the minus cinch of pi epsilon e to the i theta. So we now have a minus down here, and plus we have two i's, so i squared is minus 1, so those, those will both cancel out. Uh, going down here, we have our integral from 0 to minus pi. Again, uh, as a limit of epsilon going to 0. So again, we're going to have the same kind of issue of 0 over 0. Uh, we'll take L'Hopital's rule again, which is what we did down here. And the e of the i theta terms cancel out. The cosh of pi e epsilon, or pi epsilon e to the i theta, as epsilon approaches 0, uh, will basically become 1 because it's a cosh function. So cosh at 0 is 1. So what we're left with in the limit is 1 over pi. So then, plugging that back in here, we have 1 over pi integrated from 0 to minus pi. We get a minus 1 term out here. So that's the that's what we picked up on our C6 uh, integral. All right. For our last step, uh, we need to take our C1, C3, and C5, C7 lines and combine them as we take the limits as epsilon goes to zero and as r goes to infinity. So hopefully for C1 and C3 you can see that we wind up taking the entire real axis from negative infinity to infinity and since we have no imaginary parts we just plug them back in x. So again this is our original integral that we wanted. For C5 and C7 we have to remember that it's along the line z equals x plus i, and we're integrating from infinity to negative infinity since we were taking the top root. So uh, again, combining it in here, uh, cinch of pi times x plus i, we get minus cinch of pi x, which is useful. So actually it should be over here too. But fortunately for us, and it separated the x and the i into separate integrals, and fortunately, since cinch by itself is an odd function, 
uh, this integral from infinity to negative infinity, or negative infinity to in infinity, doesn't matter. The integral is zero either way because it's not a function. So we don't have to worry about that. And if we, since we have a negative out here, well, let's just flip the order of integration so that I'll get rid of this negative. And again, we end up with the integral from negative infinity to infinity. So after all of our terms are combined, what do we have? We have 2 times our integral, again, 1 from the C5, C7, and the original from C1, C3, minus 1 from our little loop around the point i, it is equal to 0 since we try to avoid all of our residues, or all of our poles. And thus, the integral by itself is just 1 half. All right. Uh, hopefully next time I'll get to do some other problems. Big Matt, see you later.